Well, good evening. Uh, so glad to have you in our Wednesday night Bible study. Today is September the 1st, 2021, and tonight we're going to be looking at Psalm 80. Psalm 80. If you have your Bibles, hope you'll take your Bibles and open with me to Psalm 80. We're going to be uh, referring to some other scripture as we move along, but if you'll have your Bible open to Psalm 80, you'll be able to follow along with us as we look together at the wonderful psalm tonight. Uh, I want to begin like I normally do, uh, as we normally begin, uh, just with spending some time in prayer. <clears throat> and I know that you probably have many uh, that you have on your prayer concern list, and uh, perhaps you'll want to just uh, think about those as we pray together tonight. Uh, we have many that have lost loved ones, many that... Uh, <clears throat> are uh, very concerned about what's next in their life as far as their health goes. Uh, I did receive word today that uh, we have a young man that's going to join us uh, in our time together for uh, Celebrate Recovery, which meets on Tuesday night, uh, and he wants to trust the Lord as his Savior. So very excited about those who are opening their heart to receive uh, what God has done for them through Jesus. And uh, I know that there are many uh, issues and concerns that you have on your heart when we come together for a time like we have tonight. But uh, let's begin uh, just a, a time where we pray for those uh, that are in need of prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we stand in awe of your greatness and your love. We do pray that you'll be with each and every one that uh, join us together tonight in this time of Bible study. We pray that as we open your word before us that uh, it will search our hearts and know our thoughts and will speak to us. Thank you for what your spirit can do through the word of God. And I just pray tonight your spirit would be at work in all of our lives. And uh, Father, help us to just be aware of the condition of our nation, the condition of our world. And I pray, Father, that uh, we'll not be looking around us at other people, but that we will look in, uh, in our own heart and see what is the condition of our faith, what is the condition of the world in which we live. Uh, I heard a man today say, draw a circle around yourself and no more than six feet away. <laughs> what is the condition of the people that would be in that circle? And I pray that we'll do that tonight, Father, that we'll ask ourselves the hard questions and that we truly evaluate our own heart and life. And I pray that you'll use our time together tonight to draw us into a closer walk with you. Thank you for your love for us. I pray now your blessings. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to look tonight at Psalm 80. Psalm 80. And uh, it is uh, the next in the... Uh, Psalms that we have been looking at, it's 19 verses long, uh, so we're going to have to get moving. Uh, but I, I do want to just sort of give you the introduction to the psalm. It says it is for the director of music. It is to be sung to the tune, The Lilies of the Covenant. And um, it is a psalm of Asaph, and it is it has a title in and of itself as being a psalm. Uh, you may or may not be aware that back in the book of Numbers, there is what is called a Levitical blessing. It would be the blessing that Aaron pronounced upon the Levitical priesthood. And uh, you probably know this, whether you knew it by that name or that designation. Uh, but Numbers 6, verse 23, the Bible says, Tell Aaron and his son, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. You are to say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The psalm that we have before us tonight, Psalm 80, is a psalm that is built somewhat upon this blessing. Now you need to know it is a psalm written in the dust of devastation. It is the Psalm 80 is a psalm of lament. But it is a psalm in which this passage of Scripture is front and center in the eyes of the psalmist because uh, at least four different times in this passage, 
he uses a part of this blessing to call upon the Lord. And he's asking God to turn his face back to the people of God. It seems as though God has looked away. God has taken his hand off of the people of God and uh, no longer are they being blessed as they once were. But now uh, the nation just stands in absolute devastation. Uh, a good idea of thinking of when this psalm may have been written or a time that this psalm is referring to would be 722 B.C. when the northern kingdom is falling. Uh, it has not completely failed yet. Uh, many believe that possibly this psalm was written by someone in the southern kingdom and uh, they would be referring, uh, praying for uh, the nation of Israel, uh, praying for the people of God in the north, uh, as it seems as though they're going to fall at any moment. But anyway, let me just dive right in, give you an idea of what the psalm is about. Uh, the, really, it comes to us in four different parts. Verses 1 through 3 really have the initial cry as they cry out to the Lord asking God to deliver them. Uh, but that deliverance is not going to come. And then verses 4 through 7 uh, deal with the express lament where the people are crying out to God, God because of the calamity that they see all around them and because of the shame that they feel because they allowed their sin to cause them to drift away from God. And that's why this calamity has come. Then verses 8 and following... Uh, at least down to verse 14, uh, express God's dealing with Israel. And really he uses the image of a vine, how at one time the vine had been an extremely fruitful vine, had been a very pleasant vine, uh, but all of a sudden now the vine, it's as though it has been plucked up from its roots and uh, watching the vine withering and die. And that's what the nation feels like as they are seeing the calamity around them and experiencing the calamity and the shame that comes from knowing that their sin is what has caused all of the destruction. And then the final dis, uh, section continues with the description of the uh, destruction that they see, uh, but at the same time, they also uh, begin to cry out to the Lord that God will bless them um, and that God will help them in the midst of their devastation. Once again, the first opening verses, verses 1 through 3, deal with the initial cry uh, to the Lord for deliverance. And so we begin with verse 1. Hear, O shepherd of Israel, uh, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherub cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Awaken your might, come and save us. Now, the names uh, Ephraim and uh, Manasseh may be familiar to you. Uh, if you remember, Joseph had two sons, uh, and he named them Ephraim and Manasseh. Well, they become tribes in Israel, and uh, they now are being referred to in the midst of this psalm. In the middle, you see that Benjamin is mentioned, and I would remind you that Joseph and Benjamin... Uh, were sons of the wife that Jacob loved. And so they're using these as reference uh, to hopefully call upon God and remember the special love that he had for the nation. And you hear in this psalm that he's wanting God to awaken himself. The nation is in devastation and uh, needs the, they need for God to just be awake and be aware of what's going on. In uh, verse number three, we have the, the reference to number six there that I mentioned a moment ago. And you'll see that verses three, uh, verse three is repeated in verse seven and also verse 14 and then again in verse 19. Uh, that is why I say that this psalm is built upon the blessing that you see in number six. They really are hoping in the midst of the devastation that uh, God will once again turn his face to them, that God will look with favor upon them and that he will bless them just as Le the Levitical blessing uh, had, had been instructed to pray over the people. Now the people are crying out uh, that God will indeed bless them. 
Verse number three, restore us, O God. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. And so they recognize that God is the only source of salvation. It's sad that things had to get so bad before the nation actually realizes this. Uh, but this is the way things happen. Uh, when things are good, we tend to think we don't need God. But it's when things go bad, uh, suddenly we realize we do need God. And that's when uh, sometimes if we're not careful, all hope is gone. Verse number four begins with, uh, tells us about the time uh, where the nation is lamenting over the calamity and over the shame that they feel because the calamity has happened to this place that God had blessed and was so special in the eyes of God. Listen to verse number four. O Lord God Almighty, uh, how long will your anger smolder? Against the prayers, how long will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. <laughs> you can imagine that, uh, you know, the people, uh, you know, they have, have what food they have before them that they really don't even want. They're so emotional. And so it really seems that the only thing they have to eat is the tears that they are shedding. Uh, but more than that, they are feeling the weight of God's hand upon their life. And so it really feels as though God is feeding them the bread of tears. That's what their nourishment is. They're shedding so many tears uh, that that is what they feel. Uh, you have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowl full. In other words, people are crying a lot uh, because of the devastation that they see. You know, it's so interesting to me how timely Scripture is. We talked about this last week as we looked at Psalm 79. Uh, just yesterday, just in the last days, we have seen the last of the American servicemen uh, pull out from Afghanistan, and uh, you know that nation has fell into the hands of the Taliban once again. And uh, no telling what will happen uh, to the people there that have uh, been uh, helping uh, the Americans, helping with the, uh, the cause of freedom. Uh, many have already experienced suffering because of that. Uh, but you can imagine how heartfelt uh, people crying out because they want help. Uh, you know, the images that we have seen of mothers throwing their babies to American soldiers just hoping that uh, somehow the, the children would be given an opportunity uh, to have some kind of life. Uh, a devastating time. Uh, and that's very much what uh, this psalmist is expressing here. You fed us with the bread of tears. Uh, we have drank our tears by the bowl full, uh, the psalmist would say. Verse number five, you have made, uh, verse number six, I'm sorry. You have made us the source of contentment to our neighbors all of our enemies mock us. And then once again, we have that Levitical blessing where the people are crying out that God would indeed turn his face back to them and bless them once again. Listen to verse 7. Restore us, O God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. Then in verse number 8, we find where uh, the, the writer of the psalm begins to talk about this as the image of a vine. And it's almost like he covers the whole history of Israel from the time that God first planted them to the time that they were blossoming and producing a great deal of fruit, but also to the time where the vine withers away and they begin to mock and make fun of the vine. You'll see it as we read along in verse number 8. Verse number eight, you brought us out, you brought, you bought, you brought, <laughs> excuse me, you brought a vine out of Egypt, you drove out the nations, and you planted it. When, the, when Israel came out of Egypt, God leveled all the nations out in front of them uh, and just gave them a land. Uh, that's what he's saying here. You cleared the ground for it. Uh, and it took root, and it filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, uh, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out boughs uh, to the sea, 
it shoots as far as the river. What you see is a blossoming vine uh, that is doing everything uh, that the one who planted it wanted it to do. It covered the land, even the mountains could rest under the shade of the vine. Uh, very much, uh, everything God wanted it to do, Israel was doing. Uh, but then they began to turn against God. Uh, verse number 12, why have you broken down its walls? And so that all who pass by pick its grapes. Uh, Israel being a fruitful nation, um, producing fruit for the glory of God. But now all the nations are the ones picking the fruit, uh, and they're hostile, they're uh, vicious and mean to the people. Uh, boars from the forest ravage it. Instead of allowing grapes to be eaten by people, it seems as though the wild animals, even boars, the wild hogs, have uh, entered into the garden and are picking the fruit and... Uh, you can imagine pigs in a, in a vineyard, how devastating that would be. Well, that's exactly the image that the psalmist is wanting to get for us. Boars from the forest ravage it. The, the creatures of the field feed on it. Return to us, O God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine. The root of your right hand has the root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. Now the end of verse number fifteen lets us know that he's not talking about a vine; he's actually talking about a people, and he refers to Israel here as your son, your child, this child you gave birth to. Uh, why has this devastation happened? Well, in verse number sixteen and following we find where he gets to the final section where he just continues on with the description of destruction. But notice, if you will, this psalm is written from a, a stance of faith. Even in the midst of devastation, the psalmist understands our only hope is with God. You know, sometimes when things begin to get bad for us, we begin thinking about what can we do now? Where can we turn now? The psalmist would never do that. The psalmist realizes even though all hope is lost, even though it seems as though there's nowhere else to turn, we're going to keep crying out to God. Our faith is in God. Uh, we know this calamity has come because of us, but we're hoping that God will be merciful, that God will relent from the calamity that we see taking place in the nation, and so we're making our cry to him. Look, if you would, at verse number 16. Your vine is cut down. It is burned with fire. At your rebuke, rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand. The son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and we will call upon your name. God, if you will get us out of this dust, if you'll revive this nation, our commitment is that we will call upon you. And once again, he closes by reminding us that he's praying out to, crying out to God, restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us, then we will be saved. Now, one of the things that this psalm does is helps us realize that if we're not careful, you know, this can be uh, any nation. It can be any people. Uh, people who once were a mighty nation, once who had a great faith in God, uh, that faith can slowly begin to grow dim. And when it does, uh, calamity is on its way. And folks, I want to tell you, uh, it can happen uh, to any nation on the face of the earth. It can even happen to America. Uh, it can happen in the church. Matter of fact, the estimates are that about 4,000 churches close every single year uh, in the United States. Since 1950, it is estimated that there are one-third fewer churches now than there was in the 1950. Now, this doesn't mean that God is not doing things. Uh, there are some great churches in the world today, 
Uh, matter of fact, there are some large churches. We have churches today larger than any churches we've known in the history of the world, and not just a few of them. I mean, there are countless churches that are growing uh, by leaps and bounds. But on a whole, there are fewer Christians in the United States now uh, than there ever than there has been since the 1950s. And we need to recognize that the church is withering away. I remember one day I was with a friend of mine, and we were sort of riding out through the country, and I noticed a building, uh, it was a beautiful church building. I mean, the grounds were nice and kept, and uh, I just mentioned to him uh, what a beautiful building that was. It was a beautiful church, lovely setting uh, for a church, and I just mentioned how beautiful it was. And he said they've not had church in that building and he mentioned about, I think, about five years at that time. This was a couple of years ago uh, when we were making our ride through the country. But I just thought, wow, there is a building that once a vital church had met, but now it's closed its doors, and it's just a pretty scene out in the country. I did my graduate studies in, uh, in Boston, well, north of Boston, actually, uh, but north of Boston is some beautiful churches. And there was one church uh, in Ipswich, Massachusetts. I mean, it's one of those old white country churches where the steeple seems to touch the clouds. It's so high up in the air. But I used to talk about that church every time we would drive by it. And people would say that's not near the church that it used to be. And uh, that is the truth of so many churches in our world today. Folks, I want to tell you, it's very scary when we think about what is happening to faith in America. And if we're not careful, the devastation that we read about in Psalm 80 could be the devastation we see in America if we just continue to drift away from God. Now, what does that mean for people? Does that mean we start screaming at people to wake up and get back where they need to be? Uh, well, I hope that's not what it takes for you. Uh, but... What that means is that we evaluate ourselves. What is the condition of my faith? What am I doing in my personal walk with God? How am I living out the faith that God would have me to live out? Do I have a personal relationship with the Word of God? And am I reading it on a regular basis? And the things that I read there, am I putting those things to practice in my life? Folks, I want to tell you, uh, we need to be drawing closer to God, especially in the time in which we live. Uh, these days are very critical, not only critical for our own heart, but critical for the mission of the church. We need to be reflecting and living by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for being a part of this Bible study. I pray the Lord will bless you. I pray the Lord will awaken in all of us a need for us to live out our faith and to share our faith with those who do not know him. Thanks again for being a part of this Bible study. Let's pray together as we close. Father, thank you for our time together tonight. Thank you for the words of Psalm 80. And Lord, as we just think about what that it must have been like to live in the days in which this psalm uh, was writing about, I pray that we would never have to see those days in our own life. But Father, the words of this psalm, uh, I pray that it will shake our hearts and awaken us so that we will be very much aware of our relationship with you and be very much aware of the fact that you care about the condition of our lives. And I pray, Father, that we will awaken ourselves and draw close to you and uh, live by the faith that we talk about each and every day of our life. Help us now, Father, for we give you thanks for your word, and we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.